What's the sermon you remember the longest or the sermon you remember from very far back? Um, I remember John, as a student, university student, going to the Urbana Missions Conference in America, which was a big student missions conference, and John Stott preached on 2 Corinthians, the first four chapters, and all I remember um, was that verse, we do not lose hope. I can't remember what he said, but I remember his insistence on the fact that one of the pillars of Christian life, of Christian leadership, is perseverance, not losing hope. And my heart concern for you this morning is not to remember what I say, but that maybe 55 years from now, it was 55 years ago I heard John Stott say that, you will remember the scriptures that you just heard, or a scripture from what you just heard, and that may have impacted your life all during that time. Our Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Now, I hope you all do regular medical tests and also psychological tests, and I'm just curious to know how many of you have been diagnosed with FOMO. Do you know FOMO? You don't. I can't see you, so I don't know if you could raise a hand. But how many of you know what FOMO is? Ah, good. About 5%. Well, perseverance, which you're talking about, is the antidote to FOMO. And FOMO, if you go on the internet, you will find a lot about FOMO. It is the, the disease that they say is most rampant in people in the 21st century, particularly through social media. It's the fear of missing out. You want what you want, when you want it, all the time. And whenever the advertisers get you convinced that you cannot live your life without something in particular, they've taken a course from psychologists who know that you are infected with FOMO and you will give in to their advertising. So today I'm going to give you the antidote to FOMO, the medication that will help you resist this terrible disease and that will protect you in the years that come. Um, as a young InterVarsity staff worker, I had one team member of my team who was always very exhausted. And in those days we were very young, so I couldn't understand why he was exhausted. I spoke to his pastor and I said, Pastor, why is this young man always exhausted? And he didn't know about FOMO at that time. That was a long time ago. But he said it's because he is focusing on his gifts rather than his calling. And I have never forgotten that analysis or diagnosis. And this morning I want to show through this uh, uh, study we're going to do that the practical solution to FOMO is for you to focus on your calling rather than your gifts. Many of us feel either we are taken up with one gift and we want to just exploit it to the most. So I'm a singer or I'm a preacher or I'm an artist and all I want to do is use my gift for the glory of God. So I don't miss out any opportunity to exercise my gift. I remember when I first came to Egypt, I spoke to a famous preacher, and I said, how do you decide what speaking engagements you accept? Because he was so well known. He said, Ramez, I believe that when someone asks me to speak, this is the word of the Lord, and I do everything I can to say yes. Now, I personally believe he's wrong. If you have that attitude, that you have a gift and you absolutely have to exercise it in every opportunity you get, you're going to be exhausted like my friend was so many years ago. Because we don't have a capacity to respond to every need. We don't have the capacity to serve, to use all the gifts we have at the same time. If you're a mother of small children, you have to put some of your gifts aside. If you're a father of small children, you have to put some of your gifts aside so that you raise your calling as a father or as a mother. If you have been commissioned to head up an organization and you have to do budgets and administration and lead a team, you cannot be focusing on your gifts, which may be in a different area, different than your calling. 
And I believe that focusing on gifts instead of being spiritual is narcissistic. It's self-centered. And so I speak to people, all counsel, and they're overexhausted, they're tired, because I can't give up this opportunity. I'm young, and I have to develop my gift. God has given me this gift and that gift and the other thing, and I have to I say nonsense. God is giving you a calling. He's called you to something. If you're a student now, you have to succeed as a student. You have to work hard. You have to do your exams. You can't be just thinking of your gifts. So focusing on gifts, I believe, is narcissistic, and I believe that the answer is what we have in this text about a perseverance. Paul concludes chapter 3 saying, and all we who, are with, who have unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory which comes from the Lord. It's a wonderful verse. And he has spoken about Moses having the veil and how Christ removes the veil and we can see Jesus face to face and we can, as we are seeing Jesus, as we admire him, as we are being transformed into his image. We talked yesterday that suffering was one of the tools that God uses to transform us into his image. And here it says, with increasing glory which comes from the Lord. But then he moves on the next thing right away and says, therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. We do not get discouraged. And the reason it's so important when we focus on this verse in the end of chapter 3 is because at that same conference 55 years ago, after John Stott preached on that verse, a young friend of mine came up. It was through her family that I came to know the Lord in Canada. So I owed her and her family a lot. She was a very vibrant Christian. And she told me, Ramis, this verse has touched my life. And I am yearning and pray for me that I will live in increasing glory, from glory to glory, as I serve the Lord. I was happy about that. I still remember that. But many years later, this young woman, happily married in Christian work, left the Lord, left her husband, and has never come back. She did not persevere. And my heart aches for her, and I don't know what to do. So the remedy today is, it's not enough to say, from glory to glory, we're going to serve, we sing wonderful hymns today. The key is to persevere. There's no point getting excited about Jesus if we leave him. If we run after our gifts, we get exhausted, we get burnt out, and we don't persevere. So perseverance is the antidote to the sense of trying to do everything of trying to, to express, to, to fulfill ourselves. It's actually a, a selfish view of, of self-realization, of finding yourself. And if you find yourself too much in your gift, if you're too gift-oriented, then it's like it becomes an addiction. It becomes an idol in your life. The only thing you should worship is Jesus, not your gifts, not yourself. Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly, by the way, I see that the references are all wrong here. That's chapter 4, not 3. My typos again. But anyway, it's good to have some weaknesses to confess. <laughs> we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we're wasting away, yet inwardly we're being renewed day by day. It's these earthen vessels that God has put his treasure in, and that's the treasure he is renewing. So it begins, the, the chapter 4 begins with we don't do, lose heart and ends with we don't lose heart, and that's what we're talking about today. So what is the persevering leader? We're going to look at chapter 4, verse by verse. Unfortunately, I didn't put the chapter here, so I didn't make a second mistake. Um, so we're going to look at verses, basically all the verses of that chapter, or several of the verses, and try to look at them under these four headings. The persevering leader is first transparent. He or she is resilient. He or she is hopeful. And then continually, inwardly renewed. The persevering leader is transparent. Having, therefore, having this, this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart, but 
We have renounced disgraceful and underhanded ways. Now, for the life of me, I haven't found a commentator who can help me understand what this means. What does Paul mean to have this denounced disgraceful and underhanded ways? It seems like a 21st century um, sin that we may do. We use underhanded ways to, to reach right ways, you know. Uh, we sometimes do things that are, that are wrong to justify the end. But what did Paul do? I don't know. But at least he said, I had to dis denounce disgraceful and underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word, but by the open statement of the truth, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience. By the open statement of the truth, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And brothers and sisters, I want to tell you, as someone a bit older than you, that the biggest challenge you have in the 21st century, particularly in the evangelical world, is this point about transparency because everyone here is trying to get their ministries funded. And I spoke to a very rich man at a consultation about funding, and he said, you know, I'm a businessman, I invest in businesses, I invest in stocks, some succeed, some fail. But all the reports of all the Christian ministries I've ever invested in have success stories. <laughs> he says, how can that be? Statistically, it's impossible. I'm suspicious. And I sit with Christian workers in Egypt who have to fill out 35-page reports to get support from Western organizations, and I tell them, how on earth, with very limited resources, they don't have the kind of staff we have at the Bible Society, we have an excellent writer, and we have people who help us. And I said, how do you fill out all the reports, and what do you do, and how do you answer all these questions? He said, I give them what they want. I give them what they want. How sad. It's instructive. Once we gave out 100,000 Bibles to high school students, uh, junior high students, and the group that was funding us said, how many people accepted Jesus? I went back and said, ask Zondervan how many people accepted Jesus and the Bibles they give out. Or, I'm a publisher. No, no, no. We want to know how many people accepted Jesus. So we got the staff together, and we consulted, and we talked, and we think, and in a moment of weakness, which we've never repeated again, we came up figure of 5%, maybe 5%. So we wrote back, and we said maybe, about, maybe, 5%. Eight months later, they wrote and said, give us their names and addresses. We've never done it again. We were wrong. Because we're a Bible publisher, we give the Bibles to the students in schools. How can we follow up? How can we know how many people? How can we give them their names? And we have had funding turned down. We've had people not support us because we've tried to be honest. And brothers and sisters, it's much better to sleep at night with a clear conscience than to sleep at night with $10,000 in the bank where you feel you may have used disgraceful or underhanded ways. Do not submit. Do not let anybody badger you, push you in a corner of having to say anything that you cannot say with a clear conscience. And be accountable as a staff and have your accounts being transparent and discuss with your colleagues before you fill out any report on what you've done or any claim on what you can do. And what I tell people who fund us, I said, we are not stupid. We're not ignoramuses. We're not people who just want a job. We're people whom God has called us to ministry. And like you, we want effectiveness. But as we will see at the end of this chapter, he even says at the end that the things that last are not visible. They are not visible. So some of the things that happen in people's hearts, we cannot quantify. We can say anecdotal reports, we can give statistics, we can say how many things we did, but there are some things we cannot report on, and there has to be trust. There has to be the belief, and I tell foundations and groups, ask the person, instead of filling out your criteria, say, how do you evaluate yourself? And all of us have ways to evaluate ourselves. We don't want to give out Bibles and people not read them. We don't want to, so we have ways of doing things in a way that we are satisfied that we're doing the right thing, that we're not wasting God's money. Ask us, 
our way of evaluating and take it seriously. Don't impose a cookie cutter approach, a standard approach that doesn't fit our culture or our situation. Now, I know I've stepped on a lot of red herrings here, I've touched a lot of sensitive points, but I want to tell you as an older Christian, I've made mistakes, we've made mistakes as a staff, and we decided we'd never do it again. And we try, you can't be 100%, but we try to be as honest by the open statement of the truth. We commend ourselves, not to everyone, but to everyone's conscience. And not for the board or the foundation executive, where? In the sight of whom? Of God. We commend ourselves in the sight of God. So even if you don't get the grant you wanted, at least you know you've been honest to God. Do not submit to that terrible tyranny of giving them what they want. Humbug. Give them what is right, not what they want. And I know that the intention of the funders, there are many of my friends, I know them, I've known them for years, but the change in the funding world now, it's become very professional, very business-like, very formal, and it has lost some of the ability to sense the difference. It's become very complicated, and only sophisticated people can fill out these forms, or sometimes they hire people to fill them out. So anyway, I've taken some time on this, but because transparency to me is one of the great dangers of this big kind of activity we do, funded by money that comes from people whom we don't know very well and who don't know us very well. We raise a lot of money in Egypt from Egyptians. I feel much more comfortable with that because I know that if a poor Egyptian puts money in a church offering for the Bible Society, then they mean it. They've been blessed by the Bible Society. They've seen our products. They believe in us. They know us. They know what kind of cars we drive. They know what kind of lifestyle we have. And they still are going to put their $10. So I feel comfortable. But someone overseas, I could fool. I could say a lot of things um, that are not true. And I'd still get the money. But I wouldn't get a clear conscience in the sight of God. But the persevering leader then has to be resilient. And it's beautiful the way Paul says it. We have a treasure in jars of clay, and jars of clay are not resistant. Jars of clay, you can hit them and they break. But what is resilient? Be, 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 to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. The power is not in a jar. It's not in me. It's what's in me. So I'm afflicted in every way, but not crushed. And you may feel afflicted this morning. You may feel you're being pushed back and forth. You may feel very difficult. I'm perplexed, but not driven to despair. Can you imagine the Apostle Paul saying that? Brothers and sisters, if you feel you're despairing today, if you feel you're so perplexed, so confused, that you're feeling despair, the Apostle Paul, 2,000 years ago, felt like you do. What transparency. What incredible transparency for a Jewish rabbi, a Pharisee, to, to teach, to talk about himself that way. You know, we don't dare talk about ourselves like this in the 21st century. You're not going to write a, a, a fundraising letter, a newsletter saying, I'm afflicted but not crushed. I'm perplexed but not driven to despair. I'm persecuted but not forsaken. Very deep. Yes, I feel, sometimes when you feel persecuted, you feel God has forsaken you. He says, I am persecuted, but I know God hasn't forsaken me. I'm holding on. This resilience, this ability to hold on, even if you're thinking and you keep holding on. I'm struck down. And a good translation of Phillips used to say, knocked out in a fight. Knocked down, sorry, but not knocked out. I'm knocked down and I get up again and I keep fighting. Beautiful. I mean, I could stop here. I hope you remember this for 55 years. Uh, it's so powerful. This resilience. And FOMO is the opposite of it. Running after every opportunity, trying to get everything done, trying to exercise your gift. It's very different than this resilience. This sticking to the calling and working hard for it every day. I'll talk about resilience. I'm going to talk later about my wife's work at the Garbage Village. She's on her way this morning to a camp for, for handicapped children. She's been going to that ministry for 38 years. And last night I calculated. She goes twice a day, only twice a week, I mean. I calculate that she's visited that Garbage Village maybe 4,000 times. 
4,000 times driving to a place that stinks and smells. And though she's lost some of her hearing and she has some arthritis, the Lord has not made her lose her sense of smell. She has an incredible sense of smell. <laughs> and so she suffers from her smell. I mean, she smells things in the refrigerator I don't smell. And she says, this is spoiled. I say, I can't smell it. And she has to work in the garbage village. 38 years, going twice a week, 4,000 times. That's resilience, isn't it? And she's on a bus today, and she knows it's going to be 40 degrees Celsius at the camp where they're going, 110 degrees Fahrenheit or something like this. And she's there. Resilience, perseverance. You keep doing it. But then over 40 years, uh, over 39 years or whatever, there is fruit, and we'll talk about it in a few minutes. We, we are always carrying in, we're carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be manifest. It's like we're dying. It's like we don't have much power. But the life of Jesus is manifested in our bodies through us. So yes, you suffer. Yes, you're afflicted. Yes, you're despairing. Yes, 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 yes. But people see the life of Jesus being transformed into his image. But the persevering leader is also hopeful. It's not just grin and bear it. It's not just, okay, 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 I'm putting up with it, you know this. But Paul was hopeful. He was joyful. Philippians is written from jail, and it's all full of joy. And we do Bible studies with young people, and we tell them, if Paul in jail was able to be joyful, then you in your jails need to be joyful. Let's study Philippians to know how we can be joyful in our prisons. He was hopeful. He said, since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what has been written, I believed, and so I spoke, we also believe, and so we also speak, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us up also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. You also will join me as we go to heaven. There's a film made about Paul, a secular film, and uh, I went to see it. I'm going to spoil the punchline for you, but... Uh, if you haven't seen it, it shows how Paul was traumatized by the persecution of Christians he had killed. How people he had killed were on his conscience. He could see their faces. He could see the mothers, the children, the people he had persecuted. And Paul doesn't say that he did that, but he says, me, the greatest of sinners in the gospel, assuming that he was the worst of the people all around him because he'd done the worst things to Jesus. So at the end of the movie, Paul is beheaded or he's killed. Um, I can't remember what, what happens to him. He dies. And he goes to heaven. And what does he see as he's, as he's going through the gates of heaven? Who is the welcoming? Those who welcome him are the same faces that haunted him. Those he had killed. They're standing in heaven, the women, the children, the men, and they're welcoming him. He raised the Lord Jesus, will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. Even those he persecuted will be there. A very moving, you know, whoever did that scenario of that movie is brilliant and it's so touching. And I think one day my wife in heaven We'll meet those handicapped children that she's taking today. The kids with CP in whom nobody invests. Cerebral palsy, you look at them and you say, why waste your life on a child who is useless? And when these Muslim mothers who will be going to a camp after Ramadan with her, see the love these Christians have for their very handicapped children, they're amazed. They say, nobody, we didn't love our children. You made us love our children. Why do you love them? Because they're created in the image of God. And one day I think my wife, when she goes to heaven, will beat these people. Resilience, but hope. It has to be joyful. It has to be hopeful. The Christian life cannot be sour. I'm doing my duty. I'm working so hard for Jesus. I have to be joyful about it. And it's the, the, the belief in the resurrection that gives us hope. Unless we believe that this life is only temporary. And the real life is the next one. We cannot be hopeful. Because there are so many problems here. So many difficulties, so many burdens, so much suffering. We need that. 
It is all for your sake. That's why he's suffering. That's why he's doing this. That's why Rebecca, my wife, is working with Andy. It's all for their sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. We work for people, not for, not for our gifts. So you don't run after your gifts selfishly. You run after your calling or your mission, which may not be in the main area of your gifts. God may call you to do something in an area you say, I'm not gifted, doesn't matter. God doesn't care about your gifts. He wants to call you to do something. I'm running an organization, I've been doing it for 30 years. Um, it's not my greatest gift. My gift is to lead people in small group, inductive Bible studies. That's what I enjoy doing. I'd rather have a group of five of you studying this passage with me than speaking to you. I'm against this idea of preaching when I can't interact. I love discussion, investing. That's my gift. But God asked me to do some things that are not my main gift, and I will do them for his sake. The persevering leader also is inwardly renewed. You cannot continue for 38 years like Rebecca does if she doesn't get up every morning and has a quiet time and get, get fed, get strengthened, because so many things will discourage you. And by the way, that's only one of three ministries my wife does, and the other two are with Sudanese refugees who are desperate, hungry, homeless, and every night when she comes, she goes once a week to that ministry, she comes back discouraged. She's drained because a woman with eight kids doesn't have enough money to feed her kids, and the kids haven't had food for two days. And Rebecca can't help except give a little bag of food and a bit of money. And she comes back home depressed and discouraged. We do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed. You need that inner renewal. You need to recharge the batteries. If you continue, perseverance does not mean you just keep running. It means you stop and rest and get refreshed and drink some water and be fed. Um, I sit in the, last, in the worship here in the morning because I know I'm going to stand for about 40 minutes speaking to you because I don't have endless energy. We need to be renewed. We need to be strengthened as we try to serve the Lord. Now, this is incredible. You heard yesterday the reading of a scripture about Paul talking about all his problems, shipwrecks, beatings, all these awful things. He says, for this light, this light momentary affliction. Light? Momentary? Paul, you're crazy. If I went through what you went through, I would never call it light and momentary. This is life-shattering. This is terrible. It's preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient. But the things that are unseen are eternal. Try to put that on a project report, progress report. It won't get you very far. But you're being funded to do something that is actually unseen. Very difficult, eh? And only someday when we get to heaven will we see the results. That is why you brothers and sisters need to persevere. My wife and I have been back in Egypt about 39 years now. She's been working at the garbage village for maybe 38 years. We now see the fruit of things we did in the 80s. It took us 20 years to see some fruit. That's what keeps us going. But I must admit his word, light momentary affliction, I, I couldn't say that. So a persevering leader is transparent, he's resilient, he's hopeful. Or she's, she and he are hopeful and are inwardly renewed. I want to share with you a story now of um, the Mokattam garbage village, how God used the persevering leader to change a community from the inside out and impact the world. This shows scene results. I'm going to show you scene results, but what's behind it, what made it, are the unseen work of the Holy Spirit in people's hearts and lives. There was this man named Farahat. He was a simple man, very limited education, but he had a heart for evangelism. And he went out doing village evangelism, and he, what he could do was lead people to the Lord. And one day he led his garbage collector to the Lord, the man who comes every day to his door to collect the garbage, take it back to his family. The women sort out the garbage, and then they sell some parts of it. They feed some to the pigs and animals, and they lived in a garbage dump. When the garbage collector came to know the Lord, he would come and be discipled by Farahat every week in his house, 
And finally, after two years, he told me, I want you to come and share the gospel with my family. And Farah had said, not on your life. You live in the garbage dump. It's a dangerous place. We hear there are criminals there. I don't want to go there. And he resisted. Actually, he resisted for two years. Finally, the boy was so insistent that he went. And this is what it looked like uh, when he went. See the pigs in the front there? They raised the pigs because the pigs are the only thing that will eat the garbage of Egyptians there. And uh, this is the picture a bit later in the 80s. Farahat went in the beginning of the 70s. And I want you to see in this picture at the very back of the picture, the highest building is the church. See that church at the back? That's the church Farahat eventually built in that garbage village. But the people, that's how they lived. Um, they lived... That's how they lived. The, the father and each son would have one of these little huts and in the middle, they'd be the garbage. They'd bring the garbage in. And the women, the boys would go in the morning and get, uh, all night and get the garbage from each home. And um, they'd, um, they'd end up um, bringing it back home. They'd put the garbage there. And the women, and um, they, the boys would come with their garbage trucks, bringing the car to the home. And then they would sort the garbage. You heard my testimony yesterday. That I came back from Canada to work in Egypt. We came in 1980 to Egypt. First morning, we were there, the doorbell rang. Rebecca went to the door, and she came back and said, Ramos, there's, there's some strange little boy at the door. He's barefoot. He stinks. You know, she smells very well. And, uh, and he's carrying a basket on his back. I was in bed, jet lag, and I said, he just wants your garbage. He's the garbage collector. I was Egyptian. I brought up in Egypt. These people were garbage collectors. She saw a boy who was miserable. And she went and gave him a glass of water. And she came back to bed and said something that made me very, very scared. She said, I want to minister to these people. I said, oh, no. <laughs> An American woman coming to Egypt. She doesn't speak the language. Ministering to these people. We don't know anything. It took her two years while learning Arabic to, find, to meet one person working with the garbage collector. She finally met Farahat. By that time, he'd been ordained. He became a pastor. Because as he went up to, to do a Bible study with this man's, this garbage collector's home, many were converted. So they cleared out a place. 50, 100 people met. And eventually, they built that church. I'll show you a picture of it in a minute. And uh, when she met this man, uh, Pastor Simon, he told her, look, I have a big problem. I go to the homes, and they can't read. I leave them a Bible. Nobody can read the Bible. So I'm going to start a school for the children to read so that... There will be 10, 20 years from now, there will be people in every home who can read the Bible. He was a very simple man. All he wanted was to evangelize people. He didn't care about social development. He didn't care about any of the highfalutin development things we have in our development agencies today. So um, this is what the kids look like. They considered themselves garbage. They were nominal Christians who'd escaped uh, from, uh, from the South, came to Egypt. The only place, think, job they could find to do was to collect the garbage. And they began thinking of themselves as garbage. Pastor Simon's call came as he sat in a cave in the garbage village, and there was a dust storm, and that verse dropped in front of him, a fragment from the garbage of a verse. When Paul gave, told Paul in a vision, do not be afraid, keep on speaking, do not be silent, I am with you. No one is going to attack and harm you, because I have many people in this city. And he believed, and he told Rebecca, this city is going to bless all Egypt. And she said, man's crazy. I mean, he, <laughs> garbage collectors bless all Egypt. What can garbage collectors do? They're uneducated. It's dirty. I want to help these poor people. But this guy is crazy, Ramos. He wants to bless the whole city. And they, this is a church that you could see, the highest building in the village. And he built a little, um, see the building behind it there? He still lives in that building behind the church. And my, Rebecca and I visited him two Saturdays ago, him and his wife. They're still there, serving the garbage collectors. Okay, so he was just a faithful man, persevering. He, would, uh, he says he sometimes had to go through the mud in a pigsty to catch a person to tell him about Jesus. And he was a bit of a rough evangelist. He would tell people, you have to accept Jesus. You know, he's very insistent. There was incredible growth, established a school to help children read, change... Changed people, changed their village. Social services followed conversion. People who came to know Jesus wanted water, electricity, um, schools. They wanted all sorts of things. Within one generation, the village was transformed. And 25 years later, that's 25 years after 1980 or 1974 when he was there, this is what the village looks like. 
Remember that church? That's it down there. See the circle? That's the church. The village grew. People decided they're not going to live with their garbage. They still collect garbage. But they're children of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And they have dignity. And they know Jesus. And my wife used to take, Rebecca used to take kids up to the mountain, where this picture is taken from, above the garbage village. And uh, they discovered some caves there. Uh, here's again, instead of, that's what the garbage village looks today. It's my wife's car and the pastor's car were the only two cars in the village when she went. Now she's stuck in traffic jams. Every day she goes in big, enormous trucks. So they discovered a cave right up there where they used to have, the kids used to play. And this is what they did with the cave. This is the pastor's walking back there. You can see him maybe wearing black. Okay? This is what they did with the cave. Seats 3,000 people. And people become coming from all over Cairo. We don't have a church that's that big or that's accessible. And they would come up here and worship the Lord together from all denominations, from all backgrounds. They had a worship service every Thursday night. And we said, that's fantastic. And then he found a Polish man who came, who used to carve little wooden statues. And he came up just visiting the garbage village. And Pastor Simon led him to the Lord and told him, why don't you make big sculptures on the cliffs uh, up there? And the man said, Mario said, I've never sculpted. Well... God used Mario to do incredible sculptures. And then they built the biggest church in the Middle East. This is the front of a church. This is from the inside. It seats 25,000. Now, if you told Rebecca 30 years ago that she'd be on the staff of the largest church in the Middle East, the most famous church, if you look at Google, you say cave churches, Cairo, every tour group that comes to Egypt now has to go and see the cave churches. It's a phenomenon in Egypt. She'd have told you impossible. What this man can do, he doesn't, he doesn't have any money, he doesn't have any resources, he doesn't have education. He didn't even go to seminary. They ordained him after a crash course because he said if he's going to work with garbage collectors, he can't do much harm. <laughs> when we had a, a, um, a Muslim Brotherhood challenge in Egypt where we had a revolution, the Christians of Egypt wanted to meet to pray. And they met together one night on the 11th of November 2011 to pray for the Christians in Egypt. And they, the only big place they could meet in was the garbage village. So they met in that cave and all the other caves. There are seven caves there. And they put, took the parking lots and met in them. And this is what happened that night. Now this is 30, 25 years after my wife went there, Rebecca went. Feel insignificant this morning? You feel you feel you need money, resources, you need to be contacted with good well contacts in the West. You need a good education. Focus on your mission, your calling. Give your gifts as an offering to God and persevere. Let's take a minute in prayer. What gift do you have to give up or put aside to do your calling, honoring to God and to serve Him? May our commitment be to Him and Him alone and may we persevere till we go to heaven. Amen.